March 14th. Who goes on the day? West Point Founders Day for Long Island is taking place right here. Cocktail hour. It's on YouTube, uh, 
Would you like to be? Put Here we go. Fran and Cheryl. You can take my picture. Where's Laurel? God, no. Where is Laurel? Uh huh. I don't she's, know. She's Laurel's out. Up front, there she she's out and about. Okay. Ford's over here, Mom. You guys had a uh, beautiful uh, voice and singing last year. That was great, so glad to see you again. Okay, so here is the upstairs lobby. Rico's is a spectacular location. Our hippie servings are MC for tonight. The prior uh, president of West Point Society in Long Island, the biggest Yankee and Army football fan I know, a staunch Republican, class of 1959, Bruce Medeiros. Thank you, Bruce. As, as most of you know, uh, or some of you do anyway, um, we have just come in from Venice, Florida last night and we will be going back uh, tomorrow. Uh, but I gave my word and here I am. Yay! I would like to introduce for the invocation, please stand behind your seats if you will. Father Rotondo. Before the invocation, I just want to comment that it's not too often that a priest has privilege to do so. Also, he said, you know, I'm sorry I broke up the happy hour. I was saying, and the happier hours we've been coming after that. So anyway, we're here together. And uh, for the food that we have eaten, because this is Russo's, and for the food that we will eat, because this is Russo's, and you will eat very good food, let's begin. We gather in the name of love that defines us as its family. We gather as families defined and motivated to be a loving presence and support to our sons and daughters at West Point, who support and protect us by their dedicated witness. We pray that the protection of love will be beside them, before them, behind them, be in them, whatever dangers they may have to face or challenges they may have to endure. Let them know that by our caring and supportive prayers and witness, they are not alone, forgotten, overlooked, or taken for granted, and should never be afraid. And they be reassured that <clears throat> we are at their back and the wind beneath their wings, allowing them to soar. May St. Michael the Archangel defend them in battle. May St. George help them face any dragons. Ultimately, may Christ, the Prince of Peace, hold them in his loving hands and bless the food and the people who will share that this evening. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Father Rotondo. As you have heard, most of you have anyway, from the poop deck to Washington Hall, take seats. <laughs>
anniversary of the founding of West Point. The oldest engineering college in the country. Uh, small anecdote goes with that. Uh, some years ago, when I went to be certified as a plant engineer, I had to submit my credentials <laughs> for evaluation and approval, along with two of the people who worked for me at the same time. About six weeks later, both of theirs came back, and they had been approved. I still haven't heard anything. A couple of weeks passed, I still haven't heard anything, so I call to find out what's going on with my application to become certified as a plant engineer. Lo and behold, the answer is, we're trying to verify whether you attended an engineering college. <laughs> Uh, needless to say, we had a small educational process. Uh, it, is, it is indeed my pleasure to do this. Uh, I've done it a couple of times before, and frankly, this is going to be my last time. I said it last time, and then I gave my word I would do it again. I'm here again, but Luther is going to assume these duties from here on in. I'm going to be out of here, um, and I, although I enjoy this very much, it's, uh, it's something that I'll, I'll pass on to those younger than I who are more prepared to do this. <clears throat> Founders Day presents us with a great opportunity to share amongst ourselves the knowledge that our sons and daughters have served the nation or will serve the nation and share between the older grads and the younger grads and the families the knowledge that they gained over the years, compare the new with the old, and, and to generally complete the family feeling around West Point. And this is a big family, it's a very big family. First and foremost, I want to thank Laurel McMahon and the West Point Parents uh, Club of Long Island. This is their primary function. We, we co-sponsor as the West Point Society, but the, the moving force has been Laurel from the beginning. And Joanne. And, and Joanne. Yes. <laughs> Thank God for Joanne. <laughs> Laurel, you got a few things you want to say? <laughs> I just gave her a great opportunity. Why, yes, I do, Bruce. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, everybody, for coming. And uh, just a couple of uh, things I'd like to do, some introductions of our officers that are here from the Parents Club. Um, we have Tom Dunn. He's the president of the Parents Club. We have Sharon Lee, our treasurer. Joanne Conley with her, her three beautiful daughters, 
um, realized that, that um, returning soldiers needed from, de from long deployments needed a chance to reconnect with their, with their wives. And they decided that they were single-handedly going to fill that need. They go to Fort Hamilton and um, have soldiers, families that they they they're gotten that they that they get that um, they arrange dates. But I want the girls to come up and tell you more about it, okay? So it's Joanna, Rachel, and Shannon. You're coming up, right? What?
Boy, that was terrific. That was fantastic. Thank you, girl. I think that sounds some of the older ones here a lot more entertaining than the younger ones, but that's okay. It was wonderful. To begin our celebration of the 209th birthday of the Academy, please stand for the playing of the National Anthem. Thank you. 
mark. Beautiful place. Have you ever been there before? <laughs>
to my story. Always they will echo and re echo to me on country.
Lucky Luciano Salomon. I was in 2020, here I am a private, assigned to an infantry 
nothing. And we're assigning defensive positions. I you know defensive positions in the infantry means two man foxholes, right? This is going to be two man foxholes up and down the line, and the platoon comes around assigning people at all to these uh, foxholes. And I could just visualize digging a foxhole and the lieutenant. Uh, coming to me and he says, I have uh, two people left, Private Solomon, and I want to put them in your foxhole. Yes, sir. I got Bill Smith here and Maria Gambino. <laughs> I know you can't put them in the same foxhole because Bill is D A P T. <laughs> and I turned around and looked at him and I said, Please, sir, give me Maria. I'm big enough. I just want to be my fox on. I just want to be a happy one. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is that I, I do wish that these lieutenants today uh, get into the active service of all. They don't have to be flexible with how the school, how their feelings are about going next. Don't tell. I don't know how it's going to work out myself. I couldn't tell you because I know you have a lot of hand time, a lot of pro on both sides. I don't want to take any pro here. <laughs> However, I say, you know, let's, let's hope that God bless these uh, brave uh, men that go out there and fight for us. It's tough fighting out there. This is not a good war. Vietnam is not a good war. I don't like these wars that are going on in Iraq and Afghanistan. They're tough wars, and I don't like them. And I, I feel sorry for these guys, but let's hope with these current challenges, let's give them hope. Praise and do the job, do the honor country all the way. Thank you. Thank you, Bruce. Thank you. Thank you, Lucky. I <laughs> you're, you're lucky I don't turn my daughter loose on you. <laughs> that lady sitting right over there, class of 1983. That lady sitting over there, class of 1987. <laughs> <laughs> you know, this, this idea of lucky, don't laugh because when I got into the academy, there's not too many a times when I got into the academy, so they always ask me, how did you get in the academy? Did you know Lucky Luciano? <laughs> and most of the Southern cadets were giving me that nonsense, okay? But I'm not a relative. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, <Lucky. laughs> Now we're going to move on to the person who is officially the oldest grad tonight. He was born and raised in uh, Tuscumbia, Alabama, a place I never heard of before, but I understand was the home of Helen Keller. He was commissioned in field artillery in 1960. Left the Army in 1963 to attend medical school at the University of Alabama, Birmingham, where he graduated in 1967 as an MD. Did an internship at Roosevelt Hospital here in New York. He did residencies in orthopedic surgery at Columbia Presbyterian. The key positions he's held since then are the director of ortho orthopedic surgery and then Chairman of Orthopedic Surgery at Catholic Medical Center of Brooklyn and Queens. He was the Associate Dean of New York Medical College of Brooklyn and Queens. He was the Program Director of Orthopedic Residency at St. Vincent Hospital, so we understand why he's not there anymore. Um, since St. Vincent's is now closed. <laughs> He is presently the pre a professor of orthopedic surgery at New York Medical College. He's an attending orthopedic surgeon at New York Downtown Hospital and director of orthopedic education at New York Downtown Hospital. Please welcome our guest speaker, John Denton. Thank you very much. Uh, for that introduction. Uh, just for your information, Tuscumbia, Alabama was only about 40, 50 miles uh, west of you, uh, Bruce, when you were in Huntsville, Alabama, so it's not quite that far away from you. Uh, at any rate, thank you for that introduction, and good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And thank you, members of the West Point Parents Club of uh, Queens and Long Island and West Point Society that's made this, this particular event each year the, the real success that it is. 
Uh, it's truly an unexpected honor and privilege to be representing the old West Point grads at this moment this evening. Uh, as a cadet, as a cadet I can still remember up on the poop deck bringing out the oldest living graduate who I thought looked like Father Time. So I hope this one does it. That one does it, but not this one. But all the oldest grads were cadets at one time. And like all graduates, we owe a great debt to West Point for the didactic and more importantly, the life education we receive as cadets. And most graduates will tell you that they learned a few critical lessons as cadets that played major roles in their careers, whatever their profession, in the military or out of it. And these are not just glossy platitudes, but they are hardcore guiding principles that one follows as he or she, he or she, uh, uh, moves through the years from the youngest graduate to the oldest graduate. I would like to share with you the three critical lessons that I learned at West Point. And these lessons have been my map and compass since July 3rd, 1956. And these three principles are teamwork, set a goal and accomplish it, and be persistent in the face of difficulties. Do those sound familiar? Well, they should, because these are much like they're the same attributes that are now part of the warrior creed that every soldier knows in the American Army. Teamwork. This was stressed from the moment we arrived to be assigned to a squad in New Cadet Barracks and in a New Cadet Company. I can still remember Fiery First Company, sir, as a response to Giles Harlow, who was our company commander, asking, what's the best company? I got a chance, my first chance, to build a team as a squad leader in these barracks in the summer before Cal year. We were the first class, the class of 1960, to go to Beast Barracks. I'm going to call it Beast Barracks to be politically incorrect. Uh, to go to Beast Barracks as opposed to the first class. And so I figured I couldn't, I, did, I knew how to do everything wrong, so I could sure teach them how to do everything right. So I went there as a, as a cow uh, in 1958. And it was the very best month I had at West Point. I had nine young men that I got and molded them into, I think, successful cadets. I'm proud to say that they all graduated, either because of me or in spite of me. <laughs> uh, they were so good that during close order drill, if one made a mistake, we all made the same mistake. So there was no mistake. It was the ideal, it was, it was one, one great unit. The second is to set a goal and accomplish it. Now sometimes we can set our own goals or we are given a goal, i.e. a mission to accomplish. But that's no matter. The goal has to be met. A few years ago, and I've been at Russo many, many times, uh, I was at Catholic Medical Center when I first met the Connolly family, and they can tell you many stories about us. This was the second home. This was like the officers club of that, of that institution. At any rate, I was hired there in 1987 for Presbyterian, and my mission was to build a residency program. A residency program is a teaching program in my case, which was to teach orthopedic surgeons. I had a very supportive boss, but he wanted this goal met, period. So I did not let any distractions or less important problems get in the way of meeting that goal. And there are many opportunities in hospital politics or military politics, I guess, to get off on tangents and become distracted, but I, I, I did not do that. And we were successful in building the program and took me three inspections to do it but I finally got it built. So the third thing is be persistent in the face of difficulty. Actually, in my program, and I read much like an army unit, we had uh, mottos and slogans and so forth, and persistence was ours. I didn't have any grade. Uh, Bruce, one of your, where are you? Bruce, one of your classmates down in, uh, outside Atlanta, Reinhardt, yeah. is in the stone carving business. You know that? Yeah. And I have granite plaques made for each each graduating year, and it has persistence on it. Before I get to the story, persistence, if you go home and Google persistence, you'll find that Calvin Coolidge had about 10 lines on it. He did say something, he did say something when he was president, and I recommend that to you. It's good for all West Pointers to read that. It points out you don't have to be smart, 
you've got to be persistent. At any rate, no matter what the job is, there are a lot of little setbacks and small defeats. And the critical factor is not to be discouraged, but to keep on trying. The easy way out is to quit, throw up our hands, and make up some excuse as to why it couldn't be done, anybody else couldn't do it. And my first experience with that was plead math. I'm not sure what the curriculum is now, but when I was there, plead math was like the big sieve that cut through classes like hot grease through. And so I never understood calculus, but I got through it okay. I got through okay. It took some extra work, but I got through it. But that was a time in which I wasn't sure I was going to get through it, but I was going to make them come and get me. I wasn't about to tell them I was going to go back to Tusk country. So sometimes you just have to say, not quitting is just putting one foot in front of the other. It doesn't take anything more. That's more difficult than it, can, than it sounds like many, many times. I think many people in this room know that. Just put one foot in front of the other and we'll be successful. Many of us who've done the plea marchbacks know that. All of us in ranger school know that. One foot in front of the other. So, in closing, I've given you some insight into what this, I guess I'm a pseudo oldest grad, but I'm an oldest grad and I've enjoyed this talk tonight and I wish you all the very best. Thank you very much. It is uh, one of those things that, that uh, occurs to us every now and then that we're all eventually going to be the oldest grad. Uh, <clears throat> we move on to our youngest grad. Luther will introduce our youngest grad. Thanks, Bruce. Thanks, everyone. I'm going to stick the script because I want to give all due respect to uh, First Lieutenant Joseph Kaplan. My youngest grad graduated First Regimental Commander, class of 2009, received the Douglas MacArthur Memorial Award upon graduation, chose infantry branch and was assigned to the 101st Airborne Division. As the honor graduate of his Ranger class, he was awarded the Colonel Ralph Puckett Award in July of 2010. I was deployed to Afghanistan with his unit in the fall of last year and has recently returned. He is currently serving as a platoon leader in Alpha Company 1st of 187 Infantry. It's my pleasure to introduce 1st Lieutenant Joseph Kaplan. Good evening, everyone. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Hoffman. Let me just preface by saying that uh, no one really wants to hear too much of what a first lieutenant has to say, so I'm going to keep it short and sweet. Um, I know my place in the big army. Um, but in all seriousness, um, tonight we, we commemorate West Point. We, we come gather together to remember uh, the institution. And so what does that mean as a recent graduate? It means a lot. Uh, maybe more than I could have ever imagined as a cadet. We've got some cadets in, in the, uh, here tonight, which is great. Not a great place to be at, maybe a better place to be from. Um, but, so what are, the, what are the parallels? The grind of, and, and as previously mentioned, the grind of maybe plead math, sophomore physics, uh, maybe senior year or junior English, uh, wherever the curriculum is, is now. Um, that grind translates tangibly overseas, whether it's the grind of leading an infantry platoon or preparing a brief if you're, if you're an intelligence officer. Um, my years as a cadet, and I'm not going to try to pretend it was, I'm too far removed, I've only removed two years, um, were invaluable. And I couldn't have asked for a better preparation for that, I'm very grateful. Um, I look at the video and it, it, it arouses a lot uh, inside of me now. The long gray line is tangible. You know, and there's a line, you know, grasping seat, grasping hands, looking forward to the future. Um, that's something that is more than just a catchphrase. And for the graduates uh, in the room tonight, I think uh, coming together tonight is a beautiful thing to remember that. Um, Unfortunately, buried my first classmate, a very good buddy of mine, last Monday. Uh, he was overseas with me. Uh, the Long Gray Line graduated in 2009 as well. Um, the Long Gray Line is very much alive and real, and the younger additions to that line um, are fighting overseas right now as we speak. And it's something that, in addition to West Point, 
and to the graduates and the cadets in the room tonight. Uh, something also to keep in mind are, are the graduates that are overseas fighting and their soldiers um, and, and organizations like Jacob's Light. Um, those are making tangible differences in helping support soldiers overseas. And on that note, um, it's, it's great to be able to come to an occasion like this. I'm happy I was able to get here um, and give thanks to, to a great institution that's supporting and developing young leaders in an amazing way, unlike any other institution in the world. And at the same time, remember those who've come before us and are, and are presently fighting for us as well. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We give thanks for people that are He said it was a very difficult yes. post to get, very good. and he was worried he was going to end up with a November report because of it, but he got it, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my God, Joe. Yep. Good luck. Oh God, yeah, it's a great... Put an extra digit in front of your front of your offer. Thanks a lot. <laughs> oh geez, make it hard for me, huh? Okay, here are these beautiful statues. Well done. And many of the parents and to be actually still ordered. People want them. But we got two, one for ourselves and one for our son. Okay, and you're at Columbia Medical School? That's right, yeah. Press, press wow. this up. You can use this against me at some yeah, point. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, we only post it on the internet. Don't make it see it. All your friends. <laughs> <laughs> I'm running out of tape, though. Okay. Okay, here they are. Hey, my sister, the Amelia. 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 every other year, right. Yep. Okay, Janet has returned to the table. I got her dancing out there. <laughs> yes. Thank you. Hello. It is. It is. Okay. Here it is. Good looking family. Good friends. Okay. Ross, brother Fran, Cheryl, Mr. Cheryl. Our featured speaker tonight is gracious enough to join us in the West Point. One great graduation from West Point in 1990. Uh, he was commissioned uh, into the 
in and after holding several positions in the 2nd Battalion, 187th Infantry, including a deployment to Iraq in Operation Desert Storm. He attended the Infantry Officer Advanced Force. He was assigned to the 1st Battalion, 17th Infantry of the 172nd Separate, Separate Infantry Brigade at Fort Greenwright, Alaska. Hold up there. From there, he was assigned to Company Tactical Officer and Regimental Executive Officer at the USMA. After completion of the Command General Staff College, he was assigned to the 24th Infantry Division at Fort Riley, Kansas, and deployed to Operation Iraqi Freedom. After commanding 1st Combined Arms of the Battalion of the 18th Infantry, he was assigned to his present position as Regimental Tactical Officer of the 3rd Regiment of U.S. Corps of Cadets. Please welcome Lieutenant Colonel John Marie. has to offer 
representing all of America from sea to shining sea, taking an oath to support and defend the Constitution of the United States. So that hasn't changed much. Uh, next slide. Then we do a whole bunch of stuff in the middle across 47 months. Uh, but what we do remains completely focused on our enduring mission. Next slide. And that mission is largely unchanged which is to educate, train, and, and uh, inspire leaders of character for commissioned service to the nation. And next slide. And at the end of it all, white hats still go in the air on graduation day and leaders of character emerge with shiny new second lieutenant bars on their uniforms. And now I can stop right there, but all of us in the room know that graduation is really only the beginning. Next slide. And that is the focus of what I want to share with you tonight. And that is a West Point graduate on the right on a mountaintop in Afghanistan talking to his coalition partners, uh, probably very similar to some of the things Joe experienced recently. So as each of you know, Father's Day is an amazing tradition and an opportunity for graduates and their families and friends to gather and celebrate the founding of our beloved Rockbound Highland home and its purpose. Just importantly, however, it is the opportunity to reconnect with friends and make new ones. You are all part of the long gray line, and our academy represents the gold standard in the world in education, leader development, and professional ethics. Like the soldiers you used to lead, the ones that you currently lead today, and the soldiers you aspire to lead in the future, you all here tonight are part of the 1% Club. No, I'm not talking about the 2% Club that highlights those that entered West Point and happened and was able to maintain the same uh, girlfriend or boyfriend and left four years later with that same person as their future spouse. That's the 2% club and though it is a small club and indeed worthy of respect, the one percenters are those who volunteer to fight our nation's wars. You represent the American families who provide their sons and daughters to protect our way of life. You are the ones that either personally raise your hand or stand by your soldier's side with tears of pride as he or she takes their oath and swears to support and defend the Constitution of the United States against all enemies, both foreign and domestic, and to bear true faith and allegiance to the same. You represent the 1% of American moms and dads, wives and husbands, brothers and sisters, friends and family, of soldiers that know someone that is or has been in the United States Armed Services. That number represents you. You may be saying to yourself, that can't be right. There is no way that only 1% of our population is fighting for our way of life and safeguarding our freedoms today. But it is absolutely true. It is a fact. You can look it up. You are the elite and the proud, not by birthright, education, or economic status, but by the very deed you have done or are doing today. You are protecting our nation and its astonishing freedoms. What a rich and amazing country we have that we are able to sustain a war on two fronts while involving only 1% of our population. And the infinitely small portion of that 1% that makes up the United States Corps of Cadets has been doing so for the last 10 years, fully knowing that they were going to war soon after they threw their white hat in the air. Our military academy for the past 200 plus years has accepted men and women from all walks of life and backgrounds and trains them, teaches them, and inspires them to be leaders of character who one day will join that 1% and become part of a family and a fraternity that very few join. They will become officers, leaders, eventually old grads, and one day veterans. This is who you are, and this is why we celebrate West Point's founding. Like all successful institutions, however, we have adopted to new technology, adapted to new technology, We've embraced some new level of models for leader development and evolved since our founding, but our vision and purpose remain fixed and unchanged. Our academy is the preeminent institution for leader development whose graduates are leaders of character and who serve as the foundation for our professional ethic and in our army and the nation and across the entire globe. West Point is focused on developing leaders of character who can think critically, solve problems in ambig ambiguous situations, and lead warriors. We are focused on teaching our leaders how to think and not what to think. And that is the reason for our exceptionally demanding academic program and the continuous rigors of a daily cadet's life at West Point. This is an important distinction. On today's battlefields, our, mo our most junior officers are operating in ways never seen before in the history of the Army. 
Junior officers, both men and women, in Afghanistan and Iraq are meeting with local elders in villages discussing economic development, how to improve farming practices, and increase educational opportunities. They are giving local businessmen grants and loans on your behalf as taxpayers to start businesses or improve current capabilities so that their towns or their village can prosper. They are doing all these things while simultaneously providing the very blanket of security without which none of it could occur. It would be possible. These interactions are not happening at the battalion or brigade leadership level, but at the platoon and company level. The junior officers of today's Army have to be able to adapt to their area of operation, figure out how and where the enemy exists, and not only fight that enemy, but aid the local population in fighting them as well. If you don't believe me, just ask Joe Kaplan what he and his buddies in the awesome 101st Airborne Division have been up to for the last year. A little less than a year ago, I had the distinct privilege of commanding 118 Infantry in the 1st Infantry Division at Fort Riley, Kansas. In 12 of the months I was in command, we operated in the complex operational environment of Northwest Baghdad. As a battalion commander, over 50% of my junior officers in the grade of captain and below were West Pointers. They and their ROTC and OCS peers not only engaged the enemy and firefights, but they also built medical clinics and schools. By day, our platoon leaders under my charge were working with mayors, tribal leaders, and district chiefs, and by night, they were advising and fighting alongside their Iraqi company and battalion commander partners as they kicked in doors and killed or captured the enemy. Occasionally, they actually slept. But overall, our junior leaders and soldiers must be adaptable, creative, and constantly thinking, and West Point does a phenomenal job of preparing our future officers for that each and every day. As a commander, I asked my lieutenants to be capable of two things. First, they had to make intelligent decisions in ambiguity, and second, and most importantly, they had to be men and women of character whose moral compass was unfaltering and always pointed them and their units to true north. They were able to do that because West Point continues to lead the nation as an academic institution, creating leaders that are comfortable making complex decisions in uncertain environments while understanding the significance of second and third order effects of those decisions on the battlefield. West Point also continues to foster the character development each of each of its graduates. Our programs that immerse cadets in culture and language is a step forward for us. It is one of the things that have changed over the years. Our foreign exchange and semester abroad program, which has expanded over the past few years, allowed in 2010 635 cadets to prepare to participate in various programs in 59 countries. And last fall, we had 137 cadets living in 25 different countries. Just to make things interesting, though, we thought we could send 25 cadets to Egypt in January, right before the mass riots and eventual collapse of the government took place. No worries, however, we, we moved them safely to Morocco and they continue to study there today. Our summer international enrichment program is critical to developing cadets that are culturally aware and ready to lead our army strategically and globally. Last summer we had over 400 cadets who had the chance to travel to more than 59 countries and this program, like many others, is executed in large part through the generosity of societies like yours here tonight. Our military program continues to improve and grow based on, upon the lessons learned of ten, almost 10 years of continuous combat experiences in our Army. We continuously send faculty to the field to give back to our Army, whether that be working to build the Afghan National Military Academy or working with governments to improve economic and monetary systems. We are consistently bringing leaders from the field uh, to pass leadership lessons directly to the Corps through our battle command conferences, video teleconferences with units in both Iraq and Afghanistan, and through our officership class. And at the conclusion of the cadet's 47-month experience, he or she is proficient in the basic fundamentals of war fighting and is able to think strategically while operating locally. He knows how to think, not just what to think. Our goal is to produce officers who are comfortable operating in ambiguous environments while maintaining the standards and moral integrity that are so important in today's conflict 
and have the physical skills to overcome any challenge. One thing that has changed is that we now run a mandatory training opportunity called Cadet Leader Development Training each summer, which is a program designed for first and second class cadets that focuses on putting them through a rigorous three-week program where they get little sleep, little food, little information, and little intelligence, but are tasked to lead their platoon through a series of missions that mirror today's battlefield. For those who have been there, it looks and sounds a lot like a shorter version of Ranger School. Add in the complexities of dealing with Arab or Pashtun speaking civilians, cultural and tribal strife, and using money as a weapon, and those are just a few of the items our cadet learned th during that phase of summer training. And all that is occurring 55 or 60 miles north of here at West Point, New York. CBT and CFT, Beast and Buckner as we still call them, there's nothing in polit uh, politically incorrect about saying that. They're still Beast and Buckner, and I'm pretty sure they'll always be Beast and Buckner. Um, has changed over the last year, two years, and now the cadet chain of command, rather than a regular army task force full of soldiers and NCOs, teach our cadet candidates and rising team leaders how to master critical skills. <clears throat> this change in the program puts cadets in a leadership situation where they must train our younger cadets, a truly realistic situation in which they will find themselves upon graduation as platoon leaders. As last summer CFT commander, and again going to command it this summer, I can assure you that the training we are doing is cutting edge and better than what goes on in some of the active duty army units I've seen. Our athletic program, whether company, club, or core squad, continues to be essential in developing the warrior ethos. The physical and mental toughness that is required in combat, that refuse to lose, and everyone fights no matter who you are, what gender you are, attitude, and our cadets is so critical for our leaders today. Our 25 core squad teams continue to produce winning seasons uh, and uh, championships while representing our academy and army. So I got to put a plug in for the football team that had the first winning season in a while and won the bowl game this year. Yeah. Yeah. I'm just going to predict we're going to be maybe this year, okay? But you know on record, I said it first, all right? <laughs> our DCA clubs who have produced 10 national championship teams in the last five years in sports like boxing and uh, triathlon continue to hone our cadets to be physically and mentally tough and be able to meet the demands of leading soldiers when they are hungry and exhausted. As you know, our physical, physical education department is second to none, and its program of instruction teaches our cadets confidence in how to manage violence and stress under physical duress. It has become a preeminent site for not only development, but instilling the winning spirit and warrior ethos through athletics. General MacArthur got it right when he said that upon the fields of friendly strife are sown the seeds that upon other fields on other days will bear the fruits of victory. You can rest assured that our physical programs continue to teach cats how to win the right way and are sowing those seeds every day. So with that evidence, I leave it up to you to determine whether or not the Corps has. But I will tell you that as a recent consumer of West Point's product as a battalion commander in combat, and now as one who helps produce that product each day, I am more confident than I ever have been that we are getting it right. As we get it right, however, let us never forget that sometimes it comes at a tremendous cost. Young West Point officers like Dicenzo, Ferrara, Collins, and most recently Joe's classmate, First Lieutenant Darren Hidalgo, class of 2009, who we buried at the West Point Cemetery just last week, have made the ultimate sacrifice in defense of our great nation. Because of them and the nearly 6,000 other U.S. servicemen and women that have fallen since 9-11, we better continue to get it right. In closing, I cannot thank you all enough for the support that you give to, a, to the Army and to our Academy, America's Military Academy. There is only one United States Army, and there is only one United States Military Academy producing officers for it. Your support and contributions continue to make West Point one of the top educational institutions in our country and the very pinnacle of leader development throughout the world. Thank you for all of your support to our future leaders and their mission. And on behalf of our Superintendent, Lieutenant General Huntoon, and the Commandant and Dean, Brigadiers General Rapp and Trainer, it has been my distinct honor and privilege to share this evening with you. I would be happy to answer any questions you may have, and may God bless you all and be Navy.
ce e întoarcă. I'd like to thank you for being our speaker this evening, um, Lieutenant Colonel Ramesh. And this is, this is a token of our appreciation. Please accept it. I don't have any music, so I can't do that at the moment. 
Uh, when they come back, enjoy, enjoy your dessert and your coffee, and when they come back, everybody dance and have a great time, and we'll be back here in a few minutes.
woman that does these pictures very well. I, I know her. She emails me. Oh, okay. She likes my videos. I'm and responsible I've been for the frame. Nice. Six dollars, <laughs> Well, listen. It's a nice uh, contribution. <laughs>